June 21, 1966. The airspace north of Hanoi, North Vietnam. At mid-morning, under a pale summer haze, the sky above the Red River Delta appears calm, orderly, almost static. For the pilots flying there, it is anything but. This corridor of air has become one of the most dangerous volumes of atmosphere on Earth, shaped by radar coverage, surface-to-air missile envelopes, and carefully rehearsed interception zones. Every turn, every climb, every second of hesitation carries consequences measured not in theory, but in wreckage. In this environment, MiG-21 pilots of the Vietnam People's Air Force believe they finally hold a decisive advantage. The MiG-21 is fast, slim, and brutally efficient. It climbs rapidly, accelerates past the speed of sound, and carries modern heat-seeking missiles designed for a new era of aerial combat. Soviet doctrine is clear. Speed is life. The MiG-21 is not meant to turn tightly or linger. It is meant to slash through enemy formations, fire, and disengage before the fight becomes personal. The American aircraft expected to oppose it are well known. The F-4 Phantom II dominates U.S. Navy and Air Force inventories. It is powerful, technologically complex, and built around long-range missile combat. On paper, it represents the future. Yet over North Vietnam, theory repeatedly collides with reality. Missiles malfunction. Radar locks are lost in ground clutter. Engagements collapse into close-range chaos where speed alone cannot decide the outcome. Into this environment enters an aircraft that appears out of place even to American planners. Operating from carriers in the Gulf of Tonkin, the F-8 Crusader is a single-seat, single-engine fighter whose design philosophy predates the missile age. First flown in the mid-1950s, it carries four internally mounted 20mm cannons, a feature already considered obsolete by many defense analysts at the time. The Crusader was never intended to dominate a missile-centric battlefield. Yet it is precisely here, over heavily defended North Vietnam, that it begins to alter the balance. Initial encounters unsettle MiG-21 pilots trained to expect American jets to disengage or extend away when threatened. Instead, some American fighters remain, turning hard, bleeding speed deliberately, and forcing engagements into visual range. Reports describe an aircraft that does not panic when challenged, one that seems willing to sacrifice energy to gain position. The assumption that American fighters will avoid close combat no longer holds. By mid-1966, Soviet advisors embedded with North Vietnamese units begin noticing a pattern emerging from combat reports. Not all American fighters behave the same way, and not all of them are vulnerable in the manner doctrine predicts. The question forming quietly in briefing rooms around Hanoi is no longer whether U.S. aircraft can be defeated, but why one particular aircraft refuses to play by the established rules of missile-era air combat. Within hours of those early encounters, reports reach Soviet advisory teams stationed near North Vietnamese airfields. At first, the descriptions seem inconsistent. Pilots describe an American aircraft that remains controllable at angles where a MiG-21 would lose lift. They report cannon fire at distances that should have favored missiles. Most troubling of all, they describe American pilots deliberately turning into engagements they should logically avoid. For officers trained to think in thrust-to-weight ratios and closure rates, the behavior is irrational. The aircraft is soon identified as the F-8 Crusader, a U.S. Navy fighter operating from carriers in the Gulf of Tonkin. On paper, this identification should be reassuring. The Crusader is not a secret weapon. Its performance figures are familiar. It is fast, but not as fast as a MiG-21. Climbs well, but not exceptionally. Its radar is limited. Its endurance is modest. By missile age standards, it should be inferior. Yet combat data contradicts expectation. MiG-21 pilots attempting classic boom and zoom attacks find that their initial advantages evaporate once the Crusader reacts. When a missile shot fails or is spoofed by evasive maneuvering, the engagement collapses into a turning fight. This is precisely the scenario MiG-21 doctrine is designed to avoid. The Delta Wing MiG bleeds energy quickly in sustained turns. This control harmony favors speed, not prolonged maneuvering. The Crusader, by contrast, appears comfortable at medium and even low speeds. 
The reason lies in a design choice largely overlooked outside naval aviation circles. The F-8's variable incidence wing, originally intended to improve carrier landing visibility, allows the wing to pivot upward while keeping the fuselage relatively level. In combat, this translates into controllable flight at high angles of attack. Where other jets would buffet, stall, or lose sight of the opponent, the Crusader remains responsive and visually oriented. It does not need to outrun the MiG-21. It needs only to reposition faster inside the turn. Equally important is the human factor. Crusader pilots operate alone, without a radar intercept officer. Their situational awareness depends on eyesight, instinct, and aircraft feel rather than sensor fusion. This fosters a different mindset. Rather than managing systems, Crusader pilots fly the aircraft aggressively, exploiting its limits. In close combat, this confidence matters. By late 1966, the statistical impact becomes impossible to ignore. MiG-21 units begin suffering losses in engagements that doctrine predicts they should win. Soviet advisors quietly revise their guidance. Pilots are warned not to accept turning fights against single-seat American fighters with high-mounted wings. Speed remains life, but only if speed can be preserved. For the first time, retreat becomes an acceptable option. The emergence of this guidance marks a subtle but profound shift. The missile-age certainty that technology alone would dominate aerial combat is eroding, replaced by an uncomfortable truth forming under fire. By early 1967, the air war over North Vietnam settles into a deadly rhythm shaped by adaptation on both sides. MiG-21 regiments refine their tactics, emphasizing altitude, speed, and one-pass missile attacks. The goal is to deny American fighters the chance to close. Radar operators vector MiGs carefully to minimize exposure, and pilots are drilled to disengage immediately after firing. In theory, this restores the MiG-21's advantage. In practice, it proves harder to execute. Missile performance remains the weak link. The K-13, derived from earlier heat-seeking designs, requires favorable angles and stable tracking to achieve consistent results. Rapid maneuvering, cloud cover, and ground clutter degrade its effectiveness. When a missile misses, the MiG-21 must either extend away at high speed or risk a turning engagement it cannot sustain. Against the F-8 Crusader, that decision becomes critical. Crusader pilots exploit this moment ruthlessly. When a missile shot fails, they do not disengage. They turn hard, trading speed for position, forcing geometry to collapse. The variable incidence wing allows controlled flight at high angles of attack, enabling the Crusader to point its nose where other jets cannot. In these conditions, missiles become irrelevant. The fight is decided by angles, timing, and pilot judgment. The presence of internal cannons changes everything. For 20mm guns, firing at a combined high rate provide immediate lethality without reliance on sensors or electronics. The effective range is short, but within that envelope the outcome is decisive. MiG-21 pilots accustomed to managing closure from a distance suddenly find themselves inside a threat they cannot jam or evade once committed. Combat reports show a growing asymmetry. While MiG-21 units retain successes against bomb-laden strike aircraft, encounters with Crusaders increasingly end unfavorably. Losses are not catastrophic in absolute numbers, but they are psychologically damaging. Pilots trained to trust speed and missiles are forced to confront a fighter that thrives in the very regime they are ordered to avoid. Soviet advisors respond with revised directives. MiG-21 pilots are instructed to disengage immediately upon visual contact with Crusaders unless a clean missile shot is guaranteed. Turning fights are explicitly discouraged. This guidance represents an implicit admission that technological superiority does not automatically translate into tactical dominance. As these adjustments filter through North Vietnamese units, American naval planners draw their own conclusions. The Crusader's success is not accidental. It is exposing a broader flaw in missile-centric doctrine, one that extends beyond a single aircraft or theater. The implications of that realization will soon reach far beyond the skies over Hanoi. By mid-1967, intelligence assessments on both sides begin converging on an uncomfortable conclusion. The decisive factor in these encounters is not speed, 
altitude, or electronics, but reliability. Missile technology, still immature in real combat conditions, cannot be assumed to function as designed. Heat seekers lose lock during violent maneuvering. Radar-guided weapons struggle against clutter and jamming. In this environment, the aircraft that retains a simple mechanical means of delivering force holds an asymmetric advantage. The F-8 Crusader embodies that advantage. While other American fighters depend almost entirely on missiles, the Crusader treats them as secondary tools. Its pilots use missiles opportunistically, often to force evasive reactions rather than secure kills. Once an opponent turns, the engagement shifts into the Crusader's preferred regime. Guns do not require guidance. They do not lose lock. They do not fail silently. When fired within their effective envelope, they simply work. This reality reshapes pilot behavior. MiG-21 crews, trained to trust calculated intercept profiles, find themselves reacting rather than dictating terms. Each missed missile shot increases exposure. Each second spent maneuvering at reduced speed erodes the MiG's advantage. The Crusader, meanwhile, grows stronger as the fight tightens. Its aerodynamic design rewards controlled aggression, allowing pilots to operate near the edge of stall without losing authority. The psychological impact is profound. Air combat doctrine is not just a set of tactics. It is a belief system. Soviet and North Vietnamese pilots have been taught that modern air war is fast, distant, and technical. The Crusader contradicts this belief with every close-range engagement. It turns aerial combat into something intimate and unforgiving, where mistakes cannot be corrected by pressing another button. These lessons do not go unnoticed in Washington. After action reports from naval squadrons reveal a pattern consistent across engagements. Aircraft with internal guns and pilots trained in close maneuvering outperform those optimized solely for missile combat. This realization triggers a quiet reassessment within the U.S. military. External gun pods are rushed into service for aircraft that lack internal cannons. Training syllabi begin to emphasize visual range combat once again. The Crusader's dominance is not absolute, nor is it permanent. It is operating at the edge of its range, often deep inland, supported by carrier logistics stretched thin. Its pilots accept higher risk by remaining close to enemy airfields and air defenses. Yet their success forces a doctrinal reckoning on both sides. The assumption that technology alone can replace skill is proving dangerously flawed. As 1968 approaches, the air war over Vietnam enters a new phase. The question is no longer whether missiles will eventually improve, but what damage their early failures have already inflicted on strategy, confidence, and lives. The answers will shape not just the remainder of the Vietnam conflict, but the future of air combat itself. In 1968, the accumulated data becomes impossible to dismiss. Kill ratios, mission reports, and intercepted communications all point to the same conclusion. The F-8 Crusader is achieving results disproportionate to its numbers and age. While newer aircraft struggle to convert technological promise into combat reliability, the Crusader continues to deliver consistent outcomes in the most demanding conditions of the war. Its success forces both adversaries to confront an uncomfortable truth about the transitional nature of Cold War air power. For MiG-21 pilots, the challenge is structural. The aircraft remains formidable when used exactly as designed, but its margin for error is unforgiving. Once a missile attack fails and speed decays, recovery options narrow rapidly. Against the Crusader, which is willing to accept reduced speed to gain angles, this vulnerability is repeatedly exploited. Engagements that begin with the MiG-21 holding the advantage often end with it attempting to disengage under pressure, sometimes too late. The broader Soviet concern is not merely tactical loss, but doctrinal exposure. The MiG-21 represents a philosophy centered on interception and missile warfare, aligned closely with expectations of large-scale conflict in Europe. Vietnam, however, reveals that such assumptions break down under the friction of real combat. Visual identification, pilot judgment, and mechanical reliability remain decisive factors. The Crusader succeeds precisely because it was never designed to eliminate those elements. On the American side, the implications are equally significant. 
the Crusaders' performance highlights shortcomings in procurement decisions made during the early Missile Age. The belief that guns were obsolete is no longer defensible. Combat experience shows that redundancy matters. When advanced systems fail, a basic weapon can preserve both mission effectiveness and pilot survival. This lesson begins reshaping aircraft design priorities across the U.S. military. Training philosophy evolves in parallel. Greater emphasis is placed on close-range maneuvering, energy management, and visual tactics. The experience of Crusader pilots demonstrates that these skills cannot be improvised under fire. They must be institutionalized. The seeds of formalized air combat training programs are being planted, informed directly by lessons learned over North Vietnam. By the end of the Crusaders' most active period in the conflict, its record stands as an anomaly in an era defined by rapid technological change. It is not the fastest aircraft, nor the most advanced. Yet it exposes a critical gap between theory and practice at a pivotal moment in Cold War history. The final impact of that gap will soon become evident as air combat doctrine enters its next stage of evolution, by the close of the Vietnam Air War. The significance of the F-8 Crusader's performance is unmistakable. Its success was not rooted in nostalgia or resistance to modernization, but in balance. The Crusader did not reject missile technology. It simply refused to depend on it exclusively. In doing so, it exposed a flaw shared by both superpowers during the early Cold War years. Missile systems were not yet reliable enough to replace traditional air combat fundamentals. For MiG-21 pilots, the lesson is harsh but clear. Their aircraft remains fast and lethal when used exactly as designed, but Vietnam demonstrates how quickly theoretical advantages collapse once combat enters visual range. Speed and climb matter only if they can be preserved. Against the Crusader, engagements repeatedly slow, compress, and shift into regimes where pilot skill and aircraft handling dominate. In that environment, doctrine built purely around interception proves insufficient. For the United States, the Crusader becomes a catalyst for change. Its combat record reinforces a growing realization within the Pentagon that redundancy matters. Internal guns return to new fighter designs. Missile development is reassessed under real-world combat data. Training philosophy shifts decisively back toward maneuvering combat, ensuring pilots can survive and fight when advanced systems fail. The F-8 Crusader is eventually retired, replaced by aircraft built with these hard lessons in mind. But its legacy endures. Over Vietnam, it proved that technology alone does not win air wars. Reliability, adaptability, and human judgment remain decisive. If you value calm, factual analysis of moments when military doctrine collided with reality, consider liking the video and subscribing to the channel.